Hi, this is Christopher Sutton, founder of Musical You, and welcome back to Beatles Month. Today I'm joined by Matt Blick, who is the man behind Beatles Songwriting Academy, a website dedicated to analyzing every single Beatles song to learn what makes them tick. Since founding the site in 2009, Matt has written over 500 detailed posts on what he's learned from studying the songs of the Beatles, and he's written over 300 songs himself. You see, unlike some song analysis websites you find, Matt's site is particularly notable for being very practical in its focus. Although it is fascinating to read his posts purely for interest, every one is written with the active songwriter in mind to inspire and guide them to better and easier songwriting inspired by the principles used by the Beatles themselves. In this conversation, we talk about how the Beatles could obey and break the conventional rules of songwriting so expertly if they never learned music theory. We discuss some specific ways the Beatles modified common chord progressions to be more effective and distinctive in their songs. Matt also shares what actually causes writer's block and how to fix it. We also talk about the ways Matt has benefited from all his Beatles studies in his own songwriting, including specific examples of songs he's written using principles he learned from the Fab Four. My name is Christopher Sutton, and you're tuned in to Beatles Month at Musical U. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I am just a huge fan of your Beatles Songwriting Academy, and it's been really interesting to kind of peek behind the curtain a little bit to learn more about Matt Blick, the man behind it. So I'd love if you could share that a little bit with our audience. Um, who are you as a musician and a songwriter? How did you get started in music? Okay, um, I've been playing guitar since I was 14. I started in secondary school after brief flirtations with tuba, believe it or not, and then uh, drums. Um, I uh, started playing in a band, a rock band, almost immediately, really, uh, playing kind of motley crew, hair metal kind of stuff. This was the 80s. Um, and Continued with rock bands largely uh, till the mid 90s. But along the way, always uh, seemed to get involved in lots of other kind of musical adventures. I, uh, when I was 16, I played in a band that played at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, the theatre festival. Uh, the following year, I was involved in writing the music for a show and went back to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I played uh, in a big jazz orchestra as well. Um, and then in the 90s, I started uh, attending a church and I started doing the music in church, writing music, arranging music for church. Still continued with theatre stuff, wrote for choirs um, while playing in heavy metal bands as well. Um, over the course of the years, I got involved with uh, helping refugees, and that ended up with me playing in musical situations with refugees from Iran and Iraq. Um, I later went on to play uh, in a Balkan gypsy wedding band. <laughs> as um, you do. <laughs> as you do. Um, a chaotic eight-piece monster that uh, was wonderful and terrible at the same time um and uh, just been open to really any musical uh opportunity that's come my way and just shaped me through that and then at the same time also in the 90s while i was waiting for my uh rock career to take off i started teaching guitar and that was a very big catalyst as well for me learning a lot more because uh I I honestly did it on a, a, as a little bit of a scam at first. I was on the enterprise allowance scheme and being an unemployed musician, not, not making loads of money, the choice that the government gave me was uh, get a job or we'll pay you £40 a week to start your own business. And so I started my own guitar business, teaching guitar, and I had three pupils um, and as the year went on, because they only supported you for a year and then you were on your own, um, I started to get a few more pupils. But also I, I really began to enjoy it and I began to realize that I was learning because I had to learn 
more, not only new things, but I had to understand how I did what I already did sort of uh, um, instinctively. Now I had to break it down and uh, be able to understand what I was doing and, and, and present it in bite-sized pieces to other people. Uh, so teaching was a big influence. And then probably in the last eight or nine years, I've really focused on songwriting um, kind of to the exclusion of a lot of other musical opportunities, uh, both studying and teaching and play, and doing it myself. Um, and that's where I am now. I guess I'm a singer songwriter, but more songwriter than singer. <laughs> gotcha. That's fascinating. What a, a rich and varied musical background. And what jumped out at me was that you talked both about kind of diving into all of these incredibly varied musical projects but also about having to kind of pause and reflect and learn more to be able to teach. Yeah. And uh, I think from the first bit, people might think, oh, it just all came easily to him. He was one of those musicians who could do anything. Mm -hmm. But obviously that wasn't the case. So could you talk a little bit about the learning process through that whole journey? Like how did you find learning music in general? Um, I was really, really motivated to learn Um one of the things that uh, I, I'm really grateful for in hindsight is that I went to uh, what, I'd, what I term quite a progressive secondary school. We were allowed to call the teachers by their first names. There was no uniform. And um, I think when you're, when you're a kid, whatever you, situation you're in, you think it's normal. So, you know, if you've got a horrible home life and whatever, you just think that's the way it is. And I didn't. I'm talking about education now, but I just thought that was normal as well. And it's only now as I teach in other schools, I realize how completely abnormal that was. But we had three music teachers um, and they were all um, kind of working musicians. They weren't people that just taught. So and I'm going to name check them because I, I think you have to honor where you came from. So uh, Steve Millward. Uh, Jonathan Trout and Leslie Lear. So we used to have uh, school plays, but people in the school would write the play. They would write all the music and then the kids would perform it. Um, I, I always remember one time I wrote this little um, chord sequence and I was I was one of these kids uh, that just liked to write music down, write the dots down, even though I couldn't really read it. I had a rough idea of what I was doing. And this piece that I wrote just amounted to one chord sequence with some little variations happening. But I showed my uh, music teacher, Jonathan Trout, and he stopped the lesson, the music lesson that was planned, and he got everybody in the class to play my composition. And he arranged it on the fly and said to the flute player, you play the top notes of the chord and you do this. And and, and they played my my piece of music. And again, it didn't make a big impact on me at the time because that's normal then. That's what happens in a music lesson. Your teacher just throws the <laughs> lesson plan out the window and you all jam on your tune. But... Um, that was that was an atmosphere that I was in. Um, the, one of the other teachers, um, she'd at lunchtime she'd sit at the piano and play Dr. Gradasad Parnassum by Debussy, just jamming out, just being a musician. Uh, but that that all soaked into the thing. So I don't think I'm really answering your question here, but um, it didn't come easy. No, uh, but um, I had. I took every opportunity that I could. So when uh, my art teacher said, I go to this jazz orchestra kind of night class, do you want to come along? I had no ability to play that kind of music, but that didn't stop me saying, yes, I'll have a go. I'll come along. It sounds interesting. And the same when uh, two Kurdish refugees say, we want to record an album can you find us a studio? And I said, yeah, I'll, I can book you a studio. And then he said, why don't you come and play on it? And I said, I know nothing about Kurdish music, but I'll have a go. And um, so I got to experience uh, pop music with quarter tone intervals in it and 
try and fit in and work with that. So I think it's more about just being prepared to say yes and and jump in the deep end and take some water up your nose. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much that I want to dive into and cover with you, but I do want to just pause for a second because it's not an easy attitude for a lot of people to take. I mean, hearing you describe it, it's kind of clear the benefit you get from it. But were you nervous to say yes to everything? Were you just a fearless kid and not worried about failing? Or how were you able to take such um, such an open and um, ambitious or yeah how were you able to take that attitude yeah it's it's it to be honest it's hard for me to put myself back in the mindset Mm. because i i was i was quite a i was quite a messed up kid and music was the only thing that i had that i really liked and i was the sort of kid that would have a hobby for two weeks and then have a completely different hobby and then and music was the only thing that i stuck with um but but in hindsight, I think um, I think music or progressing in music and maybe life as well is all about failure. You know, if you're going to do anything that you learn to do anything, you are going to fail a lot of times before you succeed. And and so it's not it's not looking at failure as this is a sign telling you to stop. It's just almost like if you said okay to get this bar chord the way to learn a, a, a bar chord is to fail at to do a bar chord 200 times and then you'll do it because actually in reality that is how you learn to do bar chords you know i'm just putting an arbitrary number on it but you could you could say it in a different way but why not say just do it really badly 200 times and then you'll be able to do it and i think that's certainly true of songwriting you you need to write a lot of bad songs (laughs) so tell us then about your own journey of writing bad songs how did you come to focus on songwriting in the last eight or nine years the way you mentioned well um the the two things that happened uh, uh, coincided and i don't know which one influenced the other more uh no actually i do it was song so i was looking at my songwriting and i I was realizing i was writing a very small amount of songs maybe about five or six a year i was averaging and i was laboring over them i was revising them revising and rewriting them playing them for people getting feedback rewriting them again songs would go through three or four completely different sets of music lyrics would be revised again and again and again and again um and i just thought this is not working as a thing because i I didn't feel that songs were noticeably better once i'd finally you know revise them to death i I felt sick of them mostly because i'd spent so long writing them and i i thought maybe i'm not going about this the right way so i set myself a goal to oh and uh what happened was as well i had an opportunity in the summer to use some office space to go and write every day so school holidays six weeks and there was an empty office and Uh, I've got a big family and it was, I can go there, have some peace and quiet for a couple of hours and try and write every day. And it was really fruitful. So I thought I'm going to try and write every day in uh, 2011, I think it was, or 2010. I'm going to try and do some writing every day. And at the same time, I realized that the song I was trying to write songs that were very accessible. They were mainly songs designed for congregations to sing in church. So they needed to be the sort of songs that people could pick up instantly. Um, and yeah, I was very interested in uh, music like Beethoven uh, and very complex um, music. And I thought, I need to study someone who is really accessible, but still musically interesting. And that's when Where the Beatles came into the picture. 
So I thought I'm going to I'm going to analyze all the Beatles songs in one year, and it's going <laughs> to it's going to really, you know. I'm, and also as well, I, I was I was wanting to find out are they really as good as everybody says, you know. Uh, I don't know. So I, so I started that one year project. Um, is it it's nine years ago? <laughs> I still haven't finished. <laughs> I think I've done about 90 songs out of 211 so far. So I'm not even halfway. Gosh. Well, it's interesting that you started with a bit of doubt there about the Beatles. Tell us how had you thought of them up till that point? You know, it sounds like you weren't a lifelong devoted Beatles advocate. I th- I think, um, and I don't know who who said this, but I think the Beatles are both underrated and overrated at the same time. So um, it's very because they were so culturally significant. Um, it's very hard to get past that. To what was their music? What was their musical influence? on you know uh, the pop music um does it is, does it has it stood the test of time musically and songwriting and um and uh, does it have any anything are other people now doing what they did far better than they did you know it's like nobody's driving model t fords now you you say well done henry ford for pioneering but other people have taken what you did and and expanded it and made it much better so so i didn't know and i also i think you take them for granted their influence is so pervasive that you don't notice it everybody knows beatles songs but then I realized when I thought about it, I haven't even heard Abbey Road all the way through as an album. I, I think I know it because I know lots of songs from it. But So I thought I'm going to go to the source and just find out for myself. Wow. And clearly that one year Beatles project turned into a longer project. How was the one year writing project? Uh, I wrote 47 songs in that year. And uh, one of the things that I did as well was I heard about this thing called February Album Writing Month form, F-A-W-M dot org, um, uh, which was a challenge in February to write 14 songs, one song every two days. And that would be an album's length of material. You didn't have to actually record an album. You could just demo it or even just post the lyrics. But the idea was to create an album's worth of music solely in February. So I thought, wow, I'll never do that. But I'll never manage that. Uh, no, having written seven songs in 12 months, uh, I didn't think I could write 14 in one month. But I, I thought it can't do any harm. I'll sign up. Uh, and it's a massive online community. Um, and I, f- I wrote 24 songs in February and, um, some of them were terrible, but the biggest revelation was a song that I wrote and demoed from start to finish in an hour and a half, uh, was, and still probably is one of my best songs to date. And it was written, all I had to start with was the title of a children's book that I'd seen in in a library at school, which was called Let's Build an Airport. And so from that title, I wrote a song from start to finish, complete, and uh, I still play it. It's it's the first track on on one of my EPs, and it's, it's one of my best songs. And so that showed me, actually, it's not about the agonizing over um, the the material and trying to fine tune it. If you keep writing, good ideas will come out. You, you will get the skill, your skill level increases, and then you can write good songs. It doesn't mean every song is going to be good. It doesn't mean every song is going to be a little bit better than the one before. It's a weird up and down chart but the the overall level of your writing rises and uh and again studying the beatles this is something that's that's really clear because uh i'm do i'm even doing it in a chronological order so you have uh a song like something by george harrison which is an incredible song it's an all-time classic in my opinion and lots of others um and it breaks so many rules of songwriting. 
but it's an incredible song without a doubt. And the next one that he did was Old Brown Shoe, which is a B-side. It's a terrible, terrible song. And so it's not like George Harrison got better at songwriting and then he was knocking it out of the park. He, he wrote a song. It was amazing. He wrote a song. It was terrible. He wrote another song. It was okay. It, but the overall quality, if you think about George Harrison's songs on the first couple of albums to George Harrison's songs on Abbey Road to George Harrison's songs on All Things Must Pass, his first solo album, there's a definite improvement. So, and that came from just writing. Um, the funny thing is Old Brown Shoe breaks some of the exact same songwriting rules as something does. So even that uh, plan doesn't sort of, uh, you can't nail it down to specifics. But I think the general lesson is write a lot. The only way to get good at songwriting is to write. Fascinating. So I believe this is one of your Beatitudes, your kind of not quite Ten Commandments, it's the Beatitudes, but the, yeah. the Beatles songwriting principles, which was blessed are the prolific. And another yeah. one that jumped out at me was blessed are the co-writers. So you alluded to George Harrison's songwriting there, but I think, you know, for most people, it would be Lennon and McCartney that they immediately think of if you say Beatles songwriting. And there's this, there's such a romantic aura about that duo you know that that pair of names conjures up so many assumptions about the songs they wrote what's your own perspective on that i, I mean you had a beatitude of blessed are the co-writers so clearly um it worked but why did it work do you think um there's so many aspects to their partnership that that made them the perfect partners for each other um i've often uh, thought about would it have worked with Lennon and Harrison or McCartney and Harrison or Lennon and McCartney and Harrison? And I, and I think there is a, I guess, just like a marriage or a business partnership or anything. There are good partnerships and not so good partnerships. And, and so finding someone to that, that clicks with you is, is important. Um, that's not to say that someone uh, in our position uh, has to wait for Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. Uh, it's it's good experience to co-write anyway. But what they what they gave to each other, I think, to start with, and, and maybe this is something that's really helpful to your listeners where they are, is in the early days they functioned as song finishers for each other, and actually even late, much later in their career. So, if you think about when you try to write a song, there's the what people call the uh, the the craft and the graft, or the inspiration and the perspiration. So you get you get inspired, and maybe you get a chord sequence and a bit of a melody, or maybe you get the first verse and the chorus, and then you, and then you get stuck. It's it's you feel it's flowing through you. You're channeling something, and then you get stuck. And and many songwriters will show you their folders of half finished songs. And so what Lennon and McCartney did a lot is they finished each other's songs. So you, so what you say, um, and there's a few that everybody always gives examples to, but um, um, we can work it out, is a Paul McCartney song. Try to see it my way. It's very chirpy and happy and whatever. And then John Lennon comes in in the minor, the relative minor key, life is very short. And the, and it's the dour kind of alternative to the Chipper McCartney verse. Um, and then actually George jumped in a little bit because it was his idea to do the three, four, versing and fighting my one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, I have. So that was his little contribution, uh, which was an important part of the song. Or A Day in the Life, where the bridge and they woke up, got out of bed. That was a McCartney. It was even a little bit of a song that Paul McCartney had written that they just moved into there. And the kind of um, wordless bridge that precedes that was a, a co-write. So that te took the pressure off them trying to, as I say, especially in the early days when they didn't have the skill to complete a song, that the other one would 
chip in and, and get it over the finish line. So that's one thing, a song finisher. Um, they were also massively inspired by each other. So it's you often hear people characterize Lennon was this, Lennon was political and Paul McCartney was romantic or Lennon wrote horizontal melodies that I am here as you are here, here, here or picture yourself in. It doesn't move very much with Paul McCartney is the long and winding road. He's all up and down all over the place. But those differences don't hold up because Anything that McCartney did that was fresh and interesting, uh, John Lennon immediately stole and copied. And anything that John Lennon did, Paul McCartney immediately stole and copied. So all through their career, you see things like John Lennon writes a song that echoes his growing up in Liverpool, uh, Strawberry Fields Forever. And the very next song that Paul McCartney writes is Penny Lane which is about growing up in Liverpool. And you can see that happen with instruments, with chord progressions, with lyrical themes, with structures, that as soon as one guy gets hold of something, the other guy takes it as well. So there's that kind of influence uh, exchange. And there's lots of other things as well. I don't know if there's any, anything else you want to go in on that. I could talk all day about that topic. No, but. very cool. I I think one of the things I most like about your site is it's highly practical. You know, there are some academic researchers who do the kind of hardcore music theory analysis stuff, yeah. but it's kind of hard to take that and do anything with it. Whereas your site yes. is always, I guess, because you are a songwriter yourself and you teach songwriting, it, it's always, you know, here's what we can learn from this. And I think what I loved about yeah. your write-up of that beati beatitude was you kind of ended it by saying, you know, which of these four or five roles could you do with a co-writer on? Um, I think one of the others that I remember was being an ideal reader um, where you're, you know, I think it was Stephen King, you were saying, has this notion of an ideal reader who's going to check your work and give you the most honest and useful feedback. And that's another kind yeah. of co-writing role that someone can play for you. Yeah, and it's important to say that that ideal reader is a real person because sometimes I think we can get derailed in our songwriting by imagining an audience, whether it's literally an audience or, you know, oh, this would be great if Beyonce heard this song and covered it or something like that. I think that tends to derail uh, your um, uh, writing process. But if you know you're going to show your work to a peer that you trust, and and uh, like John Lennon is going to say, that's <laughs> don't I, uh, then, you know, it's almost as you write, you know, ah, this chord progression is not going to get past them. They're going to hate this. Or then it makes you even before you get the feedback, it makes you deal with the parts of your song that, you know, aren't up to scratch. You, you fix them before you, you even get the feedback. So that's the, that's the way they function. They both had high standards and, uh, they, they knew, and, and it worked as well because the other guy was capable of writing something better. If you brought something shoddy, they, they were competing for a sides later in the career as the a side of the single. Lennon wanted his song as the a side. Paul wanted his song as the a side. So they both needed to up the game to, win that little competition really interesting and and hearing you talk about that having a high standard and you know pausing to ask yourself if the song is good enough how do you balance that with the being prolific and i guess another way to ask it is having written 47 songs in 2011 are you writing 47 every year or how have you found that balance um no i I've, I've written more some years. I've written a lot less this year because I've been working on my album. Um, but I think there's a, there definitely feels like a critical mass where you have to get through all the stages of songwriting so often that none of them have any fear for you anymore. Um, so uh, sometimes you'll be, I can't finish a song uh, or I'm stuck. I think you have to get to the point as well where you realize writer's block is not a thing. 
there, there is no such thing as writer's block. It's fear of writing something bad or writing something stupid or writing something cliched or derivative or, you know, you fill in the blanks. Uh, and once you get over that fear, but and uh, the way to do it is by writing something stupid or cliched or derivative and, you know, the world not ending, that you you stop being afraid of it. But the more important thing is that that all that judgment stuff has to come after you've written. So, you, so if you uh, try to evaluate too much while you're writing, that is what causes the paralysis as well. In a lot of writers that I work with, they're overanalyzing. Well, they're analyzing, is this any good before they've even written it? And, um, there's a, a quote in a song by Mike Viola, uh, which I, I love. It's, it's like the best songwriting advice, but it's in the lyrics of a song. And it goes, uh, songs, 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 they pour out of me. Not all of them are worth finishing, but you've got to finish them to see. And you, you, that is what I really learned by writing that song, Let's Build an Airport, is it was just song number 13 or 14 in the list of things that I was trying to write. But then after, when people heard this collection of songs, everybody zoned in on that one. I played it at an open mic, and before I'd got halfway through, there was a drunk guy at the bar singing along with me on it. Uh, so, um, you, you, you need to evaluate stuff, but afterwards is another thing. Um, I don't know how far I'm getting off the topic here, but another thing that I think is that if I played you one song and you, and I said to you, Christopher, is this song any good? You, that is such a, uh, subjective question to ask you um whether you're commenting on my songs or you're commenting on the beatles or you're commenting on your own songs but if you write 10 songs and i say christopher which one is the best that's a very easy thing to to for you to do and also for you to articulate why it is the best because these chords work better or the, 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 the lyrics are particularly good or the concept is strong. But so I think that's why another reason that it's not just be prolific because it's good to, you know, produce songs in bulk. But being prolific makes you a better songwriter. And that is one of the ways it makes you a better songwriter is you can evaluate much more clearly. Um, is Old Brown Shoe a good song? People could argue, but if you say is old brown shoe better than something, you've got to be crazy to say <laughs> it's better. You once you compare, yeah. Interesting. So, so as well as your B altitudes uh, on your site, you have what you call tickets to write, which is kind of more fine grained songwriting lessons that you've gleaned from this extensive analysis. And you know, there's umpteen different ways this can be useful and interesting to people to dive into. But I think for me, I really thought of it just now when you were talking about songwriters block, because for me, even as a non songwriter, who's just dabbled a bit in the past, as I read through that list, I was like, Ooh, I want to try that. Ooh, I could write a song like that. Ooh, that's something interesting yeah, to try. Exactly. <laughs> so I'd love if we could just share a few of those. Uh, maybe we can pick up some of the interesting musical ones. And these are, you know, across the board from nitty gritty music theory to overarching songwriting principles. And I, I think you began, I don't know if these were chronological, but the first one on the list anyway, is using the flat six chord in a major key song. Yeah, um, that they are chronological. That's why there's no rhyme or reason to the, <laughs> the number. So you, you have, uh, you know, you have a, a ticket that is just like, use this particular chord. And then the next one is quite a, or slightly esoteric lyrical concept and then there's something about arranging and then we're back to <laughs> chords again um it was a definitely what it, it was the second or third beatles song that they ever released is where this came from i can't even remember which song but basically uh, if you're in the key of a for example 
the three uh, major chords would be A, D, and E. And so um, a lot of simple uh, pop songs would use those. Something like that. And then um, nowadays we would go to this minor six and there's a whole um, industry built on the one, five, six, four um, chord sequence. But what the Beatles did uh, sometimes was, or what the Beatles did most of the time, uh, which grew out of their sort of ignorance of music theory, was used chords that didn't belong in the key. So when I studied uh, the whole collection of songs, I found that out of something like uh, 190 or so songs that they'd written, uh, there were only about 11 that did not go out of key at some point. So they, or you you perceive the Beatles as being very melodic and, very, and not atonal, you know, or, or avant-garde particularly. But out of all those songs, there was a real tiny minority that's, purely stayed in key and um that's quite amazing so one of the things they did was if you're in a they use the f chord which is borrowed from the a minor scale and sometimes they just use that on its own uh or sometimes they combine that with the g which is the flattened seven chord uh so you'd have a song that's kind of major And I, I always call that the Billy Shears uh, chord because at the end of uh, I get by with a little help from my friends and it goes Billy Shears and it sounds so happy because you've got that <laughs> raising up which would normally go to the minor chord like you would get that progression in Stairway to Heaven at the end but this goes and you just get that major lift at the end. So you'd get that in um, uh, 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 Suffragette City by David Bowie. Same thing. That's basically in the A. Hey, man, leave me alone. There's the flat six. Said, hey, man, get up the phone. So you've got that switch between major and minor happening constantly. Um because of that F chord, that flat six. So um, that's, as you said, that is exactly how I uh, dis like um, discovered the tickets and how I used the tickets. So I, I analyzed the Beatles songs. I say, hey, this is an interesting thing they're doing with this song. They're using this chord. Now I'm going to try and use it. So for me, the big one was not the flat six, but in a major key using the minor four. So in the key of A, that would be a D minor. And they use that so many times. But um, uh, don't take chances with romances. Very but um, that was a cover. That's with, And so the interesting thing as well is because the Beatles recorded covers, not only can you go, oh, this is an interesting songwriting idea that they use, but sometimes you can also see where they got it from. So they're, they're playing a cover and you go, ah, that's where you learned that idea. Um, and that's an interesting thing, I think, perhaps for your listeners, is that they didn't come out of the womb fully formed as musicians. Um, even the most avant-garde and strange chord progressions and scales and ideas, you can find the germs of earlier in their music and you can find the germs of in the music they grew up playing. So they were influenced by, um, by Broadway musicals and stuff like that, that uh, Paul McCartney's father and John Lennon's mother would sing. Um, so you get in uh, here, there and everywhere. It has this strange little intro to lead a better life. I need my love to be there. And then the song starts. That's so bizarre. What is that? Well, it's the same kind of 
verse that a jazz standard would have where you're you're in a broadway show this person's going to randomly start singing in a minute and and it's the lead into why i'm going to sing this song and they took that into pop music fascinating so there was another lovely chord progression one that stuck in my head which was about taking the 12 bar blues but doing something a bit different with it yeah could you talk about that a bit yeah, because um, people, the Beatles uh, played a lot of 12-bar blues music as they were kind of serving their apprenticeship in Hamburg. But what's really interesting is uh, in their own compositions, they very rarely played a totally straight 12-bar blues. Um, and But they still used the form. So um, it's interesting to note that something like The Fool on the Hill which is not a 12-bar blues but, or a blues of any description, but it has a 12-bar structure, which is really unusual until you think that they grew up playing 12-bar blues songs. So, But um, a more uh, straightforward one is um, Can't Buy Me Love, which uh, is uh, you, you're on the one chord to see. I buy you a diamond ring, my friend, if it'll make you feel all right. So you've got four bars of the one chord, then you go to the four chord. Give you anything, my friend, then back to the one, make you feel all right. Now, normal 12 bar blues would go five chord, four chord, one chord, five. So, and that would be, I don't care too much for money, money can't buy me love. And it works okay. But they didn't do that. They stayed on the five chord for an extra bar. Um, no, sorry, they stayed on the four chord for an extra bar. So, uh, I don't care too much for money, money can't buy me love. So they delay going back to the one chord. Now, you could say, okay, they just fiddled around with it and, that's the lesson then just muck around with things for the sake of it but what's what's the song about it it doesn't go i don't care too much for money money can't but so when you do it like that when you do it the regular 12 bar way the emphasis is on i don't care too much for money money can't so the emphasis is on money can't buy me love you're arriving back home on the word money but what they actually do is i don't care too much for money money can't buy me love and that's the point love so it's now with a lot of these ideas it was paul mccartney thinking oh i want to (laughs) emphasize love so if i delay by the course he wasn't but the the reason why uh, great artists sometimes get a little bit mystical, and Paul McCartney is definitely guilty of this, is that they've internalized the music so much. They've internalized what feels right and what feels wrong that they don't know why they do what they do. But it is for reasons like that. Why, why do you instinctively pick words that rhyme or words that chime that have similar vowel sounds or whatever? Because they feel better when you sing them. But if you analyze it, you can say, oh, because you're using the same vowel sounds all the time. So uh, and that's what I was saying to you about my journey as a teacher is that I had to to work out how I was doing the things that I was doing instinctively. Um, so, yeah. That's really cool. I, I'm glad to hear you say that because there is this kind of traditional online debate about whether you need to know music theory and everyone always points to McCartney and says, well, he didn't know music theory and he wrote some of the best songs. And I don't yeah. know, my perspective has always been, well, he didn't study music theory. He didn't know the official terminology, but he knew music theory. Like he had it in his head. Oh, yes. He knew how it worked. And I, I think it can be helpful to people to understand like, it's not about knowing the official name for this, that, or the other. It's about having that understanding of how it all fits together. Yeah, it's, it's certainly true. I mean, the Beatles, um, as we said, they didn't come from nowhere. They didn't hatch out of an egg. They, they were a, 
band that was obsessive about studying music. They would they would go to NEMS records, they would put on B-sides in the little booths and listen to them over and over and over again. They they played for six hours, seven hours a night in Hamburg, learning songs, taking requests. Um, they they knew every detail of hundreds of songs they were and so they when you say they did they didn't know any music theory you you're completely right they knew tons and tons and tons of music theory they didn't know what things were called they didn't know the labels but they knew exactly which chord would produce this feeling or this sound and 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 if you stop them maybe they couldn't explain why they were doing what they were doing just the same way if you stop picasso and said why are you doing that bit green and not red it just, just like, well if i sit down for an hour and think about it maybe i could give you an answer but it's just it feels the right thing to do but the the way you get there is by studying music and so i just think uh um, you know, sites like yours and, and sites like Beta Songwriting Academy, just making it a little bit easier. You know, y- yes, if I lock if I locked you up in a room with the, all the Beatles albums and a guitar, you would discover everything that I've figured out and that anybody else has figured out. But, you know, why not make it a little bit easier for yourself? <laughs> Absolutely. Speaking of making things easy, I love that in your list are not just these slightly sophisticated songwriting ideas that connect to music theory there are also kind of the broad things that we might overlook if we were just looking for those most distinctive and unusual things such as you have one which is repeating verse one can you talk a little bit about that yeah well um i i felt as a writer the reason any of these tickets are there is because they made an impact on me or i thought you know if it's just if it's like buy a guitar and play some chords that's not really a a songwriting (laughs) tip that i I needed to tell myself you know but um i felt that repeating a verse was cheating because it was showed you were too lazy to write another verse write a third verse so when you say repeat verse one what the beatles often did was they had verse one verse two a bridge and then they repeat verse one again which again is another idea that pretty much comes from old jazz standards but um i realized that although sometimes they did say well we were running out of time so we just repeated verse one i also realized that the beatles one of the contributing factors to them being so memorable is repetition and hooks and things like that so of course if you repeat a verse it's going to be more memorable than just having another verse and um, another thing that i had to get out of was the the need to write a bridge for every song because not every song needs a bridge um and so sometimes we've sort of subconsciously maybe picked up rules about songwriting that aren't helpful, uh, especially no, I, I would say no songwriting rule is helpful if you feel you've got to rigidly apply it every single time. Um, you can break rules, um, as I said, with the, some, the song something. Um, it's just not good to break every single rule, every single song, every single time. But uh Sometimes that little breaking of a rule can be the thing that makes the song stand out. Um, so in, in the song that I mentioned already, Let's Build an Airport, I uh, had verse one, verse one again, a bridge, verse two, and then verse one again. And th- that's probably how I could finish it so quickly. But also that's what makes it so memorable. And it was, it was such an unusual concept to begin with that um, – because the building an airport is a metaphor for uh, it's a love song basically, but you wouldn't think it from the title. Um, that it, it it bore repeating. It wasn't like I love you, you love me. Let's <laughs> let's you know make a family. So um, yeah, so repetition I think is one of the things that I've learned from the Beatles that I need, growing up playing very complicated heavy metal influenced by classical music and 
I needed to learn it's okay to repeat yourself. Um, there's the, the Beatles repeated lyrics in in other really creative ways as well, which I can talk about as well if you want mm, to. Please do. Um, um, so they would sometimes uh, repeating a verse outright doesn't work because it, you, it might be some kind of a story structure or something like that where it just doesn't make sense to go back to the beginning again. But they often used uh, lyrical structures and repeated those. So um, if you think of the song A Day in the Life, which is a, a brilliant, brilliant song, but it has no chorus. There's no So although it's very memorable, there isn't a, a traditional hook of a, you know, it's just another day in the life. <laughs> That's not there. You see why the Beatles are best, best songwriters in the world. <laughs> But what he does is he, he has a structure. So he says, I, I, um, I read the news today. Oh, boy. And then how does the next verse start? I saw a film today. Oh, boy. And then um, he's got um, uh, woke up, got out of bed, dragged a comb. And there's, there's lots of um, waking up and getting up and going. And, and so there's like little ideas that keep repeating. Um, although the news was rather sad, although the film was rather, I can't remember exactly, but th there's these phrases that keep coming back, but with different words dropped in or in the song, because uh, that John wrote, it was because the wind is high, it blows my mind because the world is round. It dry, you know, it's because the, the is the, it makes me the, and once you, use structures like that it becomes memorable and it becomes very easy to finish because you just have to fit words in the slots and you can mix and match them until you get something interesting so they did that all the way through their career with with the lyrics very cool so uh, one thing i should mention is that matt you're very good at you know just off the top of your head coming up with song examples for each of these but i should mention that you know on your site when you describe these, you list out like, here are all the Beatles songs I found that do this. And what I doubly love is yeah. you also list out, here are some other bands songs we can point to where they're doing the same thing, which I think is just a really fascinating yeah. thing, both for aspiring songwriters and music fans to just kind of take that on a listening journey. It's really fun. Yeah. Well, that's, I think that's important again, in a kind of permission way so just like i felt i needed permission to repeat verse one um you can get an idea from the beatles like a chord progression so like there's if i say um what what people call a line cliche where you have a minor chord for instance So there's a note going down chromatically within a chord, okay? So that's Michelle. So you think, well, okay, if you liked that song, there would be a lot of resistance to going, well, I can't just take that chord progression because everybody will go, you stole that off the Beatles. And then you're, you know, and especially if they're <laughs> lawyers say it. But um, then you realize that that Paul's progression in Michelle is the same as I don't want to leave her now you know I believe in how so you've got in some, something okay but then in the beginning of something you've got the same thing something in the way she moves attracts me like no other lover you've got it in the major key and then you go to something like. So. So John's using it in Strawberry Fields Forever. And then. So you go, OK, the Beatles recycled, 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 whether it was conscious or not. But there, there was chord ideas that they use. But then you find. Lots of, as you said, lots of other artists using that same idea. Then it's almost like somebody giving you permission to say, and you can use it as well. Because if the Beatles used it, and then this person used it, and that person used it, and that person used it, then maybe 
it's yours as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, and I, I, you know, I think that goes both for the kind of nitty gritty, unusual things like the chord substitutions we were talking about before, and for these things that you might kind of think were too simple or too obvious to use in your own songwriting. Yeah, but if it's good enough yeah. for the Beatles and all these other bands, maybe it's good enough for you too. Yeah, because I think what's obvious and simple in one genre is something that's never done in another genre. So uh, it might be something that the Beatles did a billion times, but in the style of music that one of your listeners might be uh, playing, it's something that's never done. And then it's um, then it's a fresh, wow, where did you get that unusual concept from? And uh, again, that's something that the Beatles were great at because they were so influenced by obviously Indian music and uh, jazz music and blues rhythm. Even Motown girl groups were a massive influence on the Beatles. And so uh, they kept sucking in all these different influences and, and maybe they weren't the best at any of those styles, but absorbing them made their music far richer. Terrific. Well, I love that, you know, you're, you're not finished this project, but you've put in a good few years <laughs> and clearly it hasn't discouraged you in any way. You know, I think some people would be nervous embarking on this to feel like maybe I'll just realize the Beatles were the best and I shouldn't bother. <laughs> clearly it's had the opposite <laughs> yeah. effect on you. It's been really inspiring. So I'd love to hear where is your music now and, and what's your current songwriting project? Um, so I have just I finished recording an album uh, called 55 Stories Down, and it is uh, an, an album of just uh, me singing and playing a baritone guitar tuned down to A. So it's a super low, still six string. You still uh, fret the chords exactly the same way as a standard guitar, but it's just seven frets lower. So it kind of feels sometimes like you're playing a bass and a guitar or just a bass. Or, um, and what I did, what I, I deliberately decided to go that route because um, my songwriting is very eclectic. I, 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 I'll write a punk song that's uh, got a political message. And then the next thing, I'll write a Christmas song that's very romantic but it's got a kind of weird little twist to it uh and then i'll write a very heartfelt song about uh losing someone that i that i loved uh to alzheimer's and then i'll write a just a, a stupid song that doesn't mean anything at all it's just about having a good time and and stylistically as well it's very varied so i felt like I needed some uh, unifying principle to bring those different things together. So I decided just to limit myself on what instrument and the, and the way I recorded it. So it's all, it's almost all live um, playing the guitar and singing at the same time. I'm just capturing the kind of best versions that I could of that. Um, and so that was that was a really interesting project. I think the 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 whole thing of limitations is a, is a blessing in disguise. I, I, I've, again, I've written about that extensively on Beatles Songwriting Academy. But um, yeah, so that album is finished. Um, I'm just in the last stages of post production, and it will be out in January. Fantastic. Well, I certainly can't wait to hear that. And I'm going away right after this interview to listen to Let's Build an Airport, which I believe is available on iTunes and Spotify and all the other good places. Yep. We'll have a direct link in the show notes to anyone else who is eager to hear that song. Matt, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Tell the listeners where they can go to learn more about you as a musician, learn more about your songwriting teaching, and learn more about the Beatles Songwriting Academy. Um, well, obviously, Beatles Songwriting Academy, you can find at beatlessongwriting.com. Um, you can find my personal uh, website is www.mattblick.com, M-A-T-T-B-L-I-C-K. Uh, it's a lifetime of having to spell my, <laughs> spell my name out for people. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well, where I'm real Matt Blick. Um, and yeah, so if anybody wants to contact me through those uh, things, I'd be happy to say hi. Would you like to hear more, enjoy more, and understand more in every piece of music you listen to? 
Active listening holds the key, and we're about to launch an exciting, brand new way to learn active listening, step by step, with music of every genre and era, including the Fab Four themselves. For full details, visit musicalitypodcast.com slash hear more. That's musicalitypodcast.com slash hear more, where you'll also get access to an exclusive time-limited special offer. Act fast and visit musicalitypodcast.com slash hear more today. <laughs>